Do you like books? I mean, really, really like books? Then you're in the right place. Each week, your host, Sam Hankin, interviews the best of today's top-selling authors and the up-and-coming superstars of modern literature. This is The Avid Reader. Here is your host, Sam Hankin. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another edition of The Avid Reader. Today, our guest is Jane Smiley, author of Perestroika in Paris, published earlier this month by Knopf. Jane is a prolific author of children's, YA, and adult works, including, as many of you know, the Pulitzer Prize winning A Thousand Acres. Perestroika is her latest work, published just after, kind of, the completion of her The Last Hundred Years trilogy, and lots and lots of books about horses. Perestroika is the long name for Paris, P-A-R-A-S, out of Northern Dancer, by the way, her journey is the main storyline of the book, but along the way, she picks up friends and acquaintances. Frida, an eloquent, elegant German short-haired pointer, and Paris is a thoroughbred, by the way. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> and of course, there is Raoul, an erudite raven who thinks quite a bit of himself. He worries a little bit about that, <laughs> too. But Frida is a mumbler, so they each have their own abilities. <laughs> Then there are Sid and Nancy, two Mallers aptly named, as we will discuss, and a 97-year-old lovely woman, Madame de Mornay, and her descendant and assistant of source, uh, he's eight years old, Etienne. Evelyn, Madame de Mornay, has had a tragic life, but lives on in acceptance and graciousness, even though there is a horse living in her house. Well, she doesn't know that. Yeah, because she's... <laughs> The animals that are oblivious to parts of human nature, but acutely keen of others, have adventures, and that's what this book is about, adventures that couldn't possibly happen. But as we read, we wonder, huh, maybe this could happen. <laughs> that's the best part of this book, which I read in one sitting, which was, I'm mad at her about because I finished at four o'clock in the morning and got it. <laughs> Okay, so welcome, Jane, and thanks so much for joining us today. Oh, thanks for having me. So I guess we should start our discussion by talking about talking animals. Where do they come from? Well, I know from having a lot of horses and a lot of dogs that they have thoughts and they have feelings. <clears throat> I also know that they communicate with one another, uh, not always verbally, but uh, they do communicate with one another. And so it was an easy step to go from knowing that they're aware that they communicate with one another, that they have thoughts and feelings, to giving those thoughts and feelings expression. Um, it wasn't hard, and I enjoyed doing it, actually. Well, let's talk about Paris first, obviously, because she's kind of our protagonist. And she's a lovely woman, her horse. So, <laughs> um, so I guess... She's a filly, excuse me. She's a filly, soon to be a mare. So yeah. um, when the book starts, she's still essentially a teenager. Right, and she's, looked forward, she's looking forward to becoming a mare. Yes, she is. So, and since I brought it up, let's talk a little bit about lineage and for those who don't know who Northern Dancer really was. Well, he was um, a, a racehorse who did a very good job and then, re then his progeny went on to win a lot of races. And so my horse, Perestroika, her sire was Moscow Ballet Another, another uh, northern dancer horse was a horse named Dijinsky. So they made up those names to, um, to show that these horses were related to northern dancer. He was a very prolific sire. Um, he was fast, and a lot of the horses that are his progeny were quite fast. But Sire lines sort of come and go in the racing business, and the Northern Dancer line has been very um, steady in its ability to reproduce. Yeah, he won the, he actually won the Kentucky Derby, right? Yeah. Yeah, and he was, I think he was like maybe the only Canadian horse who won the Kentucky Derby as well. I, I think that's true, yeah. Yeah, so 
you know, the re oh, I don't want to, I'm not going to give away spoilers, but you stop me if I get anywhere near, but okay. Paris takes a journey, obviously, to Paris. And um, it's funny because in the reviews that I thought suit, it's kind of born of curiosity. And you must have thought a great deal about horses and curiosity. And are they curious creatures in your experience? Well, some are, some aren't. Um, my Paris actually is curious. I remember when she was quite young, we were in a, in a riding arena and she went over to the mounting block and I thought she wanted me to get on her, but she didn't. She wanted to lift the lid of the mounting block and see what was in there. She couldn't, there was no food in there. She wasn't smelling anything delicious. And then after that, almost every time we went into the, that arena, she'd want to go over to that mounting block and check it again. And then subsequently, every time she saw a mounting block, she was hoping there was a lid that she could lift. She looks up into the woods. She looks around. She keeps her eye on things. Um, I just think she's a, she's a curious horse. She's always snuffling my pockets, even if they don't have any treats in them. So, yes, she's curious. I tend to jump around a lot, but that made me think of one thing. It was about Frida when she's wondering about Paris, just like what you're saying about the smell. She says, she says to herself, it's really good I have such a good sense of smell. Otherwise, I'm lost in this city. <laughs> and, you know, she knows, okay, she's up this block and she turned here. And then I think she turned here and I think she turned here. And I kept thinking, wow, that would be, because I have a horrible sense of direction. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great if I could do that? Well, there, I'm sure for a dog, there are a lot of things to smell in Paris. You know, there's restaurants, there's people, there's um, trash. And that's the way dogs, as, according to my research, that's the way dogs orient themselves in a lot of strange places, like in the woods or whatever, because their sense of smell is much sharper than humans and in some ways sharper than their sense of sight. So um, that was sort of a logical jump for me, but I just thought it would work. Yeah, and it definitely did. And also it helped with Frida in the sense that um, she was kind of the helper animal that mm -hmm. she helped with food, she helped with orientation, but mostly with food. And, and if you want to, you can tell the story of the purse first to get us set up. <laughs> well, at the very beginning, when um, the groom unintentionally leaves the stall door unlocked uh, and then goes off to the bathroom, and, the f and one of the first lines is, and Paris says, why not in the stall? Um, uh. She could never answer that question. Um, Paris bumps her chest against the door of the stall, and horses often do that. Um, and this time the stall door opens, and so she starts walking out uh, into the twilight. And the, the groom has left her, per there's nobody else around, and they're just waiting for the trailer to come back. And the groom has left her handbag uh, on the ground near the purse, along with a couple of other things. I mean, excuse me, she's left her handbag on the ground near a couple of other things. Mm -hmm. And Paris notices it because she's seen humans, female humans, pull things out of handbags. And she knows, she knows it's called a purse. And she also knows that whatever she won in the previous race, that she just won is also called a purse. So she figures that's it, that's her purse. She doesn't know the details about human words. She just knows what she hears. So she picks up the purse and she carries it with her into the woods. And after a pretty long walk through the woods, um, mostly because there's various bits of grass and She's curious, but there's also various bits of grass and stuff to eat. She comes to um, a plaza called the Place du Trocadero, and she's still carrying the purse. And um, by that time, it's, it's very early morning. It's almost dawn. And she has the purse with her. And 
the funny thing she doesn't is, know what it's for. She just knows it. It's a belonging. And Frida, who's had her master friend, mm -hmm. long lost buddy Jacques and his guitar, she kind of knows that money means something, and so she says she looks in the purse and sees what's there and sees what. <laughs> And then she's so ingenious. And, then, and there's so many nice people in the book. And when I re read about it, another person said this too about it. Isn't it nice to read something like this where everyone <laughs> is in this world where we don't have that, I don't know, luxury or that's not what's going on right now. But it was so nice to talk about, I'll let you talk about it, then you can say whether to spoil it or not and not do it. Talk about how Frida takes the purse and what she does with it and the nice man and all that, because that was fun too. Well, Frida, <clears throat> Frida, I, I did look up the vision capacities of dogs, and I looked up the various um, colors of euros, and I saw that Frida would be able to distinguish between the the euros that are in the purse, and because her her owner who has died work was a street musician um she knows that money comes and money goes she's had that he had a kind of semi-successful but iffy life he was a very independent guy so she knows what money is for she knows it's in the purse and she she has a little chat with paris and she realizes paris has no idea but then she thinks, okay, I could walk away with this purse. But she decides not to. Yeah, and it's funny because, uh, well, there's a couple of things. W one is that Frida, much like men and women who are attractive and Frida's beautiful, she gets a lot of things be because she's beautiful. All the people she meets go, oh, what a beautiful dog. And, and she knows how to move them along by giving them her paw or putting yes. it in she's life. a good trickster. Yeah. <laughs> but the other, one of the other things she's learned to do in the winter is to to play a part, to tremble and as if she's shivering, which means that people pity her and give more money. She loves sausages. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, that's the other thing about um, Paris that both Frida and Raul, they don't really make fun of, is that she's so, her naivete, and Raul especially, that she just doesn't know these things where he knows pretty much everything, at least he thinks he does. Well, for, he, he's a raven. For a raven, he's, he's pretty old. So he would be like, your, like your, your uncle, your old uncle, who could never stop telling you stuff that um, he had learned over the years. And you know, and you would roll your eyes and say, I wish he'd shut up. But sometimes you'd learn things from him, too. Well, he spoke seven languages. <laughs> <laughs> According to him. <laughs> yeah. I think the funniest thing in the book, and I don't know why it's the funniest, is when he says, and of, but he does say, I speak seven languages, but of course, all birds speak Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking, you know, that kind of makes sense, but I can't tell you why it makes sense. <laughs> Well, I think it makes sense because that's the largest population of of speakers in the world. So if birds are going to learn human languages, they've got to learn the one that has the most, you know, speakers. It also seemed to me like, eh, it seems obvious, like, the way <laughs> that it is Chinese that I'm listening to in the morning. Um, the other thing that, that's quite clear, in addition to your love of horses, is that you must love the city of Paris. I do. One of my favorite things to do is to just walk around. Yeah. Um, it's very, because of the way it's set, um, the, you know, the geography of the setting, the, the landscape is quite various. There's hills, there's flat areas. There's incredibly beautiful buildings. There's incredibly old buildings. Um, it's wonderful to walk around in. There's nature, you know, there's parks and there's, um, I don't know. It's, it, 
the last time I was there, which is now about two years ago, I was put in a hotel near the Bastille, which is on the east side. And I just walked all the way across to the um, Champ de Mar and the, and the Square de Trocadero. And I walked through the Botanic Garden. I walked through the Herb Garden. I just couldn't get over how fascinating it was. It's funny because um, in this room, I'm just writing down notes. Uh, with the Eiffel Tower, um, it reminded me, I read this book and I interviewed the woman who wrote it uh, called The Sun Collective, the guy who wrote it. And in it, the woman, had, she has a small stroke, but after her stroke, she can hear animals talking. So, oh, really? Oh, I should look at that one. It's called The Sun Collective. It's doing very well. But in any event, um, so her husband is like really late getting home. So they're all waiting by the door and she's going, I wonder where he could be. I'm so worried. And the dog says, uh, he'll be home soon. Don't worry. Don't worry. He'll be here. And she looks at the cat and the cat says, why do I care? <laughs> and like when uh, Paris looks at the Eiffel Tower and Ro will say, what do you think of it? And she goes, why should I think anything? Because there's so many things that humans do that animals really would have no interest, especially cats, would have no interest in. I would say so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and you touch it. I think one of the interviewers asked you, where are the cats? And, uh, you, I, yeah, why didn't the cats fit into this? Well, I don't know that you can have a cat and a rat as <laughs> characters in the same book. I love and I didn't, I didn't want to put the, um, any of the animals in too much danger. And I feel that if there were cats, then that would be a threat to the rat. And the, and the rat feels that too. Yeah, and, and Paris doesn't want anything to do with eating a rat. You know. <laughs> no. I like the way that Kurt, I think, yeah, Kurt, he's like, he needs a, he needs a wife and he, he needs to get out. <laughs> You know, and he's a rat. He needs to find a woman really quick. Yeah, he's young. He wants he he wants to reproduce. He lives alone with his uh, his father in this old old house where they have lots of tunnels, but they don't have any companions. And he really is lonely. He's he's in some ways more lonely than uh, the boy, the eight year old boy, probably because he hasn't learned to read. I'm kind of like you because when I was a little kid. We had mice in the house. And I had this picture in my mind. I was about Etienne's age. And I thought the mice must have lived like in a little room inside the wall. <laughs> come home from work and sit in the rocking chair with his pipe. <laughs> his paper, because it seemed logical for me that they lived there. So just like they have, just like they have, they have like a living room. And <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was one of the things that was so nice about the book. And I think probably for a lot of people, is it probably brought up things from their imagination that they hadn't thought about in years because it's all childlike. And even though this is not a kid's book or a young adult book, it does reawaken, I think, a lot of curiosity that some of us have given up on, the way people don't look up at the stars, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. That's good. Thank you. That's a compliment. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's, you know, basically that's what life is, is just, just remembering to wonder, just remembering to think, what am I doing here? What is all this stuff? And you really bring that out. Um, well, for me, the thing that it causes me to remember is when I was Etienne's age, that's what I wanted. I wanted a horse friend. I was an only child. My mother had, um, my mother remarried when I was 11. And now I have a, a brother and a sister. But at that point, I was an only child. My cousins were around from time to time, but not very often. And so I really wanted that horse friend. Um, I thought that horse friend would be nicer to me than the girls in the neighborhood were sometimes. Yeah, and, and going to what I was saying, Raul kind of, he pretty, peg, he pretty much pegs it when he says, you know, I've been watching humans a lot, and basically all they do is they kind of lay on their backs with their mouth. <laughs> And then they walk around stuffing their faces. <laughs> Christmas time, they drop most, most of it on the ground. He's, he's a critical sort of guy. 
Yeah, well, he's kind of like a curmudgeon, and I think. So. <laughs> um, well, there are some practicalities that you deal with fairly well, but you might as well tell us how does a horse live in a house, even though it is a mansion? You know, just uh -huh. being down and resting and getting up and walking outside to do his business, things like that. Well, the boy helps the horse. Um, there, there are, there's the entry door that she, there's several entry doors and there's the one that she originally comes in. So there's only one step up in that one and a horse can go up and down steps as my horse Perestroika has gone up and down steps. Um, especially if there's no rider on the horse. Um, and then there's a back door uh, since it's a mansion, um, and used to, there used to be big parties. There's a back door and a back courtyard where uh, people would deliver the food for the parties when there when when there were a lot of people living in the house. So that's the door that she goes out to out into the back courtyard to do her business. And the rooms are very large. Uh, they have a lot of windows. Um, Etienne moves the furniture so that she, she can Paris can move around. And because it's an old mansion, the doors, the, you know, the, the doorways are wide enough and tall enough for her to get through. Um, so if it, it'd be different if it was, you know, um, let's say a, a mission style house in California. I'm not quite sure she could. I'm not quite sure she could live in that kind of house or in, let's say, falling water, you know, that. Oh, like, <laughs> but yeah, and the other thing is I was thinking first, okay, the pooping and the peeing, and it's taken care of pretty well, but then I was thinking, why should I even question it? No one ever <laughs> any book, you know? <laughs> There's no characters that go to the bathroom in any book. Ever. <laughs> and I assume the queen never goes to the bathroom. Oh, I don't think she does, no. <laughs> no. The other funny thing was when Frida thinks no good can come with this whole arrangement. And that's when she becomes, when she needs her, some Prozac, because she comes, becomes despondent and she's just wandering through Paris. And then she still has a bill or two left. She gets a bag of stuff. But what she really wants to do, and it reminds me of my dog, is she wants to get a, <laughs> she wants to get a ball. And she... <laughs> <laughs> she dropped the heavy bag in order to show the, the doubt. A lot of these people were dour and sour until they see her, and she just makes them love her. But so since she gets her ball and all that, and then in your interview, I heard you talking about your dog and how he'll pick up rocks. And just, oh, yeah. And my dog does the same thing. Really? Yes, he loved because he has to have something. When you come home, he grabs a towel or rag, has to bring huh. it. Bring, what it. kind of dog is he? He's a golden doodle. He's running around right now. And he's like huh. 80 pounds, but he thinks he's a lap dog. And <laughs> he's great. I love him. And he's named Putney. And all my life, all of my dogs have been named Putney. So he's oh. like, because I feel if I ever get Alzheimer's or dementia, at least I'll remember the name of my dog. <laughs> well, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. Maybe. I hope I have one left. Let me say. <laughs> but anyway, yes, I just uh, was in tune with that because he'll just pick up anything. He'll pick up a rock. Well, when Frida, Frida has since passed, but, and she was about almost, she was 15 when she passed. But one of the things she loved to do was rip open dog toys and pull out the stuffing. Yeah. So she had a lot of eccentric habits. Um, our Labradoodle doesn't have those kind of habits. She's much more reserved in everything except tail wagging. It is funny. And, and that's, it's also a source of a lot of entertainment, amusement, and serious stuff in the book is that these animals that we take for granted, they do, they all have different personalities. Mm -hmm. I wonder how they develop, almost like is it a nature or nurture type of thing? And uh, I don't know. I, what do you think? Well, I, as far as dogs, I, I don't know. It, 
but horses, it's both because I've bred horses and I've noticed that they shared a lot of characteristics, not everything. They weren't like rubber stamp reproductions of one another. But um, the ones that I've had have all been alert. They've all been aware. And I read a theory that said that in a herd, some of the horses are sentinel horses. And it's their job in the herd to keep their eye on, you know, whatever mountain lion is heading their way. And then other horses, usually mares, are the boss horses. And their job is to keep the herd organized and disciplined. So I think that, uh, that horses for sure have nature and nurture. And you just hope that they're well-trained but that they also come from a good, uh, easygoing bloodline. Yeah, it's interesting. I read somewhere that the way you can tell the kind of person, what a kind of person is like, is how he treats his dog when no one's there. Oh, really? Huh. Which I think is very true. Yeah, I think that's true too. Well, so, of these animals, obviously you have dogs, obviously you love horses. Do you have any experience with ravens? <laughs> no. But one of my favorite little items about famous, famous novelists is that Charles Dickens did have a raven. He had a talking raven. And that always fascinated me. And um, so I maybe I, I would like to have a raven. I, I wouldn't know what to do with it or how to treat it. But, um, you know, yeah. people have had talking ravens. I think it would be fun. Nor have I had a rat. But my stepdaughter, who went to an animal, uh, animal behavior school, one of her animals was a prairie dog and she also had rats and she said they were quite interesting and amusing and smart yes so um yeah no i've never had a rat but we've had rat in-laws well i had a rat and her name was ratina and <laughs> she lived in a drawer in the garage and she had stuffed the drawer with bits of cotton and toy mm -hmm. had a lovely time and we'd feed her but then one day we decided, we really, I forgot why we decided this. We didn't really thought we shouldn't have, she was big and we shouldn't have a big rat. So we got, put her in the car and we drove to a nice field and let her go there. And then yeah. the next day when I opened the drawer in the garage, there she was. <laughs> how far did she come? How far did she have to come to come back? At least three blocks. Huh, that's funny. I know. Well, see, they're really smart. The animals are really smart, and um, they like things to be consistent too. I like the way you're, you know, you're talking about Charles Dickens. I like the way that Raoul is somewhat put out of joint by the fact that people, of course, the Latin names I don't remember, but people just think parrots are so cool because they can talk. You know, <laughs> see, I can talk as well. <laughs> He just, he just likes to, um, he is a little bit like me. <laughs> <laughs> and, but, and the other way he's like me is he does have this outside commentator that's saying, you know, maybe this is a little much. <laughs> Back on this a little bit. And he does in one section, he, he, he says, I sh I'm going to say this. And he says it in his mind and he goes, no, I'll just say this instead. <laughs> well, we've all known people like that, so. I guess we've known, and you know, if you go outside, you can hear the birds shouting at one another. You know, they have something to say. They aren't just um, saying it as out of habit. So, they're, I like birds. I would like to, I'd like to know a bird, but I don't. Well, it's true about that. People and birds is because I have an independent bookstore where your book is sitting prominently on the front table, and. Mm -hmm. um, so I have a couple of customers that I just can't, I can't. 
if I start with them, it's 20 minutes of them and they don't listen to a word I say. So like, because <laughs> I'm person, I say to them, look, you have two minutes. If you can't say it in two minutes, <laughs> so some of them are completely alienated by that, which is fine. And the other people I've trained. Oh, that's good. That's really good. It's not easy. And every, all, no, it takes time and effort. That's for sure. And you have to go slowly. And it irritates me because my employees who I'm paying are sitting there talking to him about um, his experience with Henry Kissinger in China. I hope he's okay. not kidding. And, and he'll go on for at least half an hour about that. Yeah. At the front desk and there's customers waiting and I, you know, I have to constantly... Uh, I call them on the phone and tell them it's an emergency so that they have <laughs> That's a good idea. That's a good idea. Oh, the other good excuse nowadays is if someone asks you to do something on a certain day, just say, no, I'm going to be in a Zoom call then. <laughs> you, you can just say that any time and everyone accepts it as an excuse. Yeah, they do. Yeah. <laughs> well, so going through the thread of the story, did, did you have, when you started this, did it, like, was it full blown from your head, like Athena from Zeus, or did you just kind of like? No, it, it's much more fun in my experience to come up with an idea and then follow it through and see what happens. That's the kind of books I like to write. Right. The ones that um, unfold bit by bit as you follow the characters and you, and you understand the characters. Um, one of the great things that I enjoyed about the last hundred years trilogy was starting with babies, giving the babies um, personalities and, char and characteristics, and then seeing as the babies grew up how their inherent characteristics would mesh with their families and with the world around them. And so that was similar to this. I just, I, I prefer when things unfold. So you're kind of watching the babies grow up as the reader is? Yes, I was, yeah. That's really cool. Um, yeah, so it's, it's um, in one interview you talked about how this kind of book was kind of rolling around in your head, even when you were doing the trilogy, and you just, mm -hmm. you kind of put it aside, but then it just kept coming back and coming back. Yeah. That's what happened. Yeah, so, so now, even though the book ends kind of, well, no, I'm not gonna talk about that, but it, it almost seems like you could continue, not necessarily with this one, <laughs> but you could continue, you have such a voice and voices for these creatures. And like I said, at first you think, nah, this is unbelievable, but as one interviewer said, no, yeah, it kind of makes sense. Well, in order to continue, I would have to go to France and explore well, a lot in order to see where the next volume would take place. So um, uh, we're just going to have to wait until I can, I can get to France and wander around and wander around and wander around. Well, hopefully we'll all be able to do that soon. Yes. Yeah, I, that sounds like fun. Maybe I'll go over just so I can get the lay of the land as well. <laughs> Yes. But anyway, Jane, thanks so much for joining us today. It was oh, great. sure. And um, thank you for having me. And hopefully we'll be reading another volume sometime soon. I hope so. Okay. Talk to you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.